Chris gotten on yet? Not, yet. Not that I've seen. Has he been in contact with anyone about able to call Chris? We'll get started and and if somebody's able to call him while while we get started and and see what's happening there. I'll do that. You will. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I need to read the statement here of. Uh, to start it off, so pursuant to Section 7E of the Open Meetings Act, I, as president of the McHenry County Conservation District, have determined that is that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent at this time because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and Governor Pritzker's related disaster declaration. I have further determined that the physical presence of an employee or member of the public body at the regular meeting location is not feasible due to the disaster described in the de governor's declaration. With that, we will move forward to roll call. Megan, could you call the roll, please? Sure. Uh, Trustee Campbell? Here. Trustee Thomas? Here. Trustee Brandt? Here. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Fritz? Here. Trustee Dom? I don't think he's there yet. Uh, and Trustee Henning? Here. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll open the meeting up to public comments. Number one, is there uh, someone from the public that would like to make an uh, initial comment or qu uh, presentation? Any hands going up? Okay, then we'll move forward. Uh, I guess the first thing is just, uh, I called this meeting or we've called, held, we're holding this meeting, uh, trying to come to a consensus on any, any or all of these uh, items that have been brought forward so that when we uh, vote on, on budget going forward, everyone can be uh, comfortable that we've uh, come to a conclusion as a board and, uh, and we can present a budget that we all can get behind. Now there may be an item or two here or there that maybe won't go a, a certain person's by their view or what they think is prudent, but hopefully we, uh, we understand that as a board, we've come to a, 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 an agreement and we can be unified behind that, that budget when we present it. For that, I'll turn it over to uh, Director Kessler and um, she can, if she has any more comments, then we'll move on from there. We are under some time constraint. If we run out of time, we will we will move these on to Thursday night's meeting. But we'll uh, hopefully we can get through all of this. Great, thank you, President Henning. So in front of you, um, we have five items that were left without a consensus, and I guess it would be great to go through each one and just really determine up or down. Um, some of them, which as I'll go through, have already been modified in the tentative agenda that will be in front of you for approval on Tuesday night. You'll have time to discuss this um, you know, on Thursday as well, but we'd like to get some direction. If, if they are out, because we've moved them based on past conversation and you would like, or the decision is to add them back in, then we will make a notation and then the final budget, which will come forward in February, will represent those changes. Um, two items that were already modified out from our last conversations in December, um, we did uh, move out the McConnell T-Barn roof. We took that out. We also took out the Crystal Lake repairs for 15,000. And then we did adjust the generator down from 90,000 to 50,000. Um, the two items that we left in the budget at this point is the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative for 12,000, and then the one-ton dump truck, which is a replacement at 55,000. So I guess the best, if you are agreeable, to go through them one by one and make a determination, does it stay or does it go, or does it get modified? And um, I'm going to stop the screen share so we can see everybody more appropriately, and uh, we'll go through it. Piece by piece. So the first one uh, is 4.1a, the McConnell T Barn Farm, which currently is out of the tentative budget based on past conversation. Um, just to clarify, this does not mean that the Board of Trustees has made a decision on uh, the status of the structures. This is just that there's no funding um, for this year 
for that roof replacement. Yeah, well, I'm gonna start. I, uh, you know, I made an impassioned request to keep that in, it's out. And I just wanna repeat that it's very difficult for me. I saw the square barn when it was still up, that was square barn road was named after before it was destroyed by a developer. I saw the round barn on river road fall down. And I said, I'm never gonna let that happen under my watch again. Um, but um, I might be the only one so I uh, feel that I've been heard and it's out of the budget. So I will leave it at that. Anyone else with a comment? Thank you, Dave. I, I, I understand your passion for that. And um, it, it is hard to watch them go down. Um, is there anyone else who would like to comment? Um. I'll go ahead and comment. I won't go back into what I talked about before, but I do see there's a lot of potential for that particular property long term. Um, so I understand where uh, Trustee Brandt's uh, passion is coming from. I talked before about the uh, living history farm um, as a working farm. And honestly, without the tea barn, it probably wouldn't be as um, significant. Um, I think that's a big part of the overall uh, complex there. Uh, but I understand that we don't have the money in the budget right now. So I think to, to Elizabeth's uh, comment, um, it's not the conversation about the McConnell barn is not over probably in, to some extent because we do have people from the public who have expressed interest in saving um, some of those structures. So, uh, but I understand right now, we just don't have the money for it. So I understand that it's out. Um, that's part of the budget that we're moving forward. And I'm just hoping that we keep our options open for partnerships going forward. That would be ideal if we can if we can find some partnerships on some of these properties and find find the best use and and, and best funding going forward. And okay. I agree with that. Anyone else? So I'm assuming that anyone I don't hear from is in agreement with with what has already taken place at the at this time. So if if any so at this time this is not part of the budget. It, and Dave would like it to be part of the budget. Lynn would like it to be going forward and, and but not at this time. Is that, so does anybody else have a comment? Otherwise, we're, I'm gonna assume that it's five people with the understanding that it's not gonna be in the budget this time and that it's gonna be something that we continue to study. I'm comfortable with that. I would leave it out for now. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Sounds like right. we have a concurrence on, on the McConnell. It remains out. OK. Uh, Crystal Lake tunnel repairs for 15. This was also removed from our discussions in December, and we took that out. Is there anyone that is in disagreement with that? No, I don't, I don't, I'm not in disagreement with that at all. I think it's not a safety issue at the moment. Um, it is something, though, that we do need to work on going forward and understanding what the responsibilities are and working in partnership with the city. So, um, but not with this particular budget. I concur. Okay. I think Elizabeth, can you, can you clarify where your discussions are with the Crystal Lake administration? Is this something that's been brought to focus uh, with them? <clears throat> Absolutely. After our prior discussion, um, I did reach out to the city manager, Gary Meyerhofer. We had a nice conversation. Um, he and I suggested that our staffs from our planning, our engineers, um, they sit down and have a conversation. And so uh, that uh, was yet to be coming uh, once we got through the first of the year uh, with the holidays. And so we anticipate them sitting down at some point. Um, it clearly, um, you know, I did follow back up also with legal counsel. I think I may have shared that with you before. And the district has no uh, legal responsibility for the tunnel. Um, and so, because um, we did not sign that agreement with the state of Illinois. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I'm not hearing anyone stating that they want that put back in. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, at this point in time, I'm going to say it's six to zero and, and we're going to leave that out. Okay, could we move to the diversity, equity, and inclusion 
$12,000. Elizabeth, do you have anything you'd like to comment on that? Uh, the only thing just to, to, based on the conversations that we had before, and I've, I've talked with some trustees, um, and the staff that's running it, the working group, um, which for the district, many of those team members are taking part in the Illinois Park and Recreation Association Conference. Uh, Jackie Barrow, who is the lead, who did the presentation for you uh, back in December, um, actually has been seeking out a variety of training um, and as a young professional uh, was enrolled in the Loyola University program, uh, also has been taking coursework in Northeastern Illinois Volunteer Center on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so taking part in a lot of the free trainings or things, um, so that's great. Uh, Becky, who's with us from Education Services, she is a trained diversity uh, expertise in this as well. Um, Jenny Hyder and I also, um, as well as many of the leadership team engage in legal symposi symposiums and things like that and, and diversity, inclusion, um, a variety of things relative to the ADA. Um, the purpose though is to do an outside consultant to come in and assess just to make sure we start off on the right foot. Um, that's why the 12,000 is necessary um, to bring a consultant in to do some outreach. And um, it's not that we're not doing the training, but this is very difficult to facilitate from the inside out, even though we've got a variety of individuals that have uh, experience and expertise. Uh, that is why we're still promoting that forward um, at this time. Well, I will have to sp uh, speak in. I, I still am frustrated for the reason it was pulled from the budget, but I think staff did a great job saying exactly why would they think we need it. Some comments from the board was which should be internal, but they already said in their presentation that they are in the trees and they can't see the forest because they're in the trees. So to expect staff to know internally how to fix it, I think is inappropriate and wrong. Uh, we have Shauna, our own executive director of the foundation, that says increasingly you can't just show a statement that you are not going to do anything wrong with, with regard to those things. And they want to see it a statement on describe any internal or external efforts you have besides the um, uh, just the statement. Uh, and lastly, uh, we could risk funding because we aren't doing anything. Uh, so I think because the staff is looking for someone from the outside to look in, I think it's something that we need to do and I'm, I'm, I want it to stay in the budget. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, yeah. Dave. I'd like to say something. Okay, hi, Linda. Um, I just want to make it clear that I, it's not that I don't think that we should do it. We absolutely, I feel like we should be doing something. Um, but Elizabeth, you just said that many of these employees are already in training and have done the training. Is, uh, that, is that the understanding that I just heard? The leaders of the working group are very much in tune, but we have a have whole- Have they taken training? Have they gone through the training of the DEI? Several team members have, yes. Okay. But we have a whole organization of 73 plus full-time team members that are not as familiar or necessarily aware of. And so um, not taking advantage of the training. And again, it's more than individual training to know what's right or wrong. It's looking at a whole systemic of the organization, right? I understand that. I understand where you're um, a difference between a consultant and training. Right. I am just wondering if there is a less expensive way to go about this. Um, and it's hard because you and I didn't talk and I, I, I do have avenues where I I've have other experiences in this where it has been done a different way, not in the consulting, but in training. Um, so I get the difference. I'm just, again, feeling that there might be another way in this without spending so much money. That is my only caveat to this. I just feel like, is there another way? And I know that your team and I really applaud them for what they've done and what they want to do. It's just a budget thing. It's just money. So um, I, I'm going to go with the consensus of the, of the trustees and I'm going to trust that they 
that this is what is going to go. I just want to be heard that I do feel that there could, there is another way. I don't know that way, um, except maybe to do more training with more people at a lesser amount. But at that, I'm going to let it go. I'll, I'll speak uh, briefly. It seems to me that in the back and forth of uh, paper uh, that uh, we've seen between the last meeting and this meeting, I saw a paragraph, and correct me if I'm wrong, where the number had been reduced from 12 to 8. There um, was, they were asking, I think Andy asked if it could be reduced to 8 which yeah, I, I would be in total agreement with as well, Bill. I had suggested well. the place because the board was not at the December meeting. I suggested, was I able to get this to move with the 8,000? The 8,000 was the cost or what was estimated for the consultant to come in. The key thing too, and, and I appreciate Linda. And, and so I did pass that information on to the DEI committee and to Jackie. And I think a conversation of resources um, to facilitate, and there are many ways to get to the same result. Um, absolutely, right, right, right. right. So we need to be open to that, and as well as there's many organizations. I just got one today through United Way. They're doing a, a large campaign for race and equity, and um, again, free free opportunities that are out there through webinars. I mean, they've been offered throughout for the past year. Um, the uh, the eight thousand. Um, what the committee has shared with me is that this is an opportunity maybe for a grant. Um, and if we were to get a grant though, we would probably need a matching amount to go out and leverage that um, is a matching to be able to be successful with that. So we do need some seed money. Um, you know, they asked for 12. I tried to mitigate down to the eight to see at least something because that would cover the cost of the consultant and, and be able to leverage that with a grant opportunity. I can get on board with eight. You know, when you go to buy something and the salesman tries to get an idea of your budget, if you let them know that you're going to spend X, you can be sure you won't see anything offered for less than X plus a little bit more. So um, I think um, this, you know, uh, a big, uh, well, <clears throat> I respect the sincerity of the people who th feel that this is important. I think it is important to respond to perceived problems. I think we can start the ball moving in that direction. Uh, and maybe it'll take longer to get to the destination, but uh, to me, $8,000 is a, a considerable amount of money for a consultant. Um, and uh, that would be what I would support. Okay, so I have a couple of people at 8,000. I have Dave who's on board for the full 12, which is good. I, everything's fine. Um, I've got a couple people I haven't heard from. Uh, let's see, Lynn, I haven't heard from you. Um, yeah, no, I, I had sent in um, the email with the response to the different uh, levels. And um, so in that particular email, I had indicated that I was fine with the $12,000 um, in order to get, I, I see this as training and how, and I also see it as kind of a management issue. So I think you can look at this two ways, right? Um, management in terms of how does our executive director and her management team seem or deem the best fit for them in terms of training and what their needs are to get the culture that they want and uh, what is it that they, they think they need to bring everybody together. Um, I, you know, it's certainly within, it's well under the purview of, of, of the executive director's dis decision in making decisions regarding um, purchases, right? So, it, it, it twelve thousand dollars to eight thousand dollars. We're talking twelve thousand dollars to eight thousand dollars. We're talking four thousand dollars on a nine point nine million dollar budget out of the general fund. You know, whatever. I mean, if it if they feel that they can get it done with eight thousand um, dollars, I'm not going to say no to that. I think that this is something that we ought to be doing. It's clearly there is passion for it. Um, if this isn't just in our agency, it's it's all over. 
Um, I, under, I appreciate the individual training. I think that's wonderful. The larger issue in an organization that's sev over 70 people is that not everybody has the same idea of the value of this, maybe because of their own hidden biases. And uh, you know, training from within can be difficult because people don't necessarily wanna listen to what you have to say and bringing somebody out from the outside um, can bring in those fresh eyes and, and a, more of a neutral person to, to present the topic. So if, they can, if, if, it, if staff feels they can get the job done that they think is important for them at $8,000, I absolutely would support that, yes. Okay, so you're on support for eight or twelve, whatever it takes is, is kind of whatever it takes to get it out in, in there. I you you'd prefer the twelve, I take it, but you would rather have eight than nothing, I'm sure. Well, I think well, and I think that the tw if twelve is more than they need, if they're starting to re recognize that there might right. be some other opportunities for grant opportunities, absolutely. If I'm if we can save four thousand dollars, fine. I, that's absolutely fine. You know, if we had if we budgeted twelve and we only spent eight. It's 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 four thousand dollars. It's not going to jump up our reserve so much that it's going to be a problem. Um, but if that's if um, we feel we can get it done, then that would be fine. Okay, and I appreciate I appreciate everyone's concerns. Okay, and Pat, um, I'd be in agreement with eight. Um, sure, that's a start, but I'm sure it's once you get into it, it's probably going to cost a lot more than that. But um, eight's a start. So I'm in for eight. Okay, Elizabeth, you've got you got three or four directors at eight, a couple at twelve. Uh, nobody's saying to cut it completely. We all realize that it's important, and and um, I, I guess I, I I don't know what I don't know what a consultant that in that version or what all of this is going to cost. I, I uh, assume that all of you did some homework on that before you threw the 12 number out there. Um, I'd be happy with either one. I, I know this is very important going forward. I do have a lot of faith in our staff that they will do the right thing and that they will, um, that I, I, I think that they, I, I have more faith in the, that they could do this themselves than, than a consultant can coming in and looking at us for a week or two. But on the other hand, I, if they don't feel comfortable in that and they need some backup, that would be great. Um, I, I don't know that $4,000 makes a lot of difference. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just, I, and I didn't, I didn't want to jump in while you're trying to make that no, point. No, you're I, fine. I guess, I guess what I was thinking as you were speaking was that just because it is 12, doesn't mean it's, it's going to get spent. Right. And I, time and time again, you and I know and, uh, and have seen over the, three and a half years that we've been here that um, staff, if they don't have to spend the full amount, they don't spend the full amount. And um, so it's not like just because we say it's gonna be, you know, if we allow for 12, it's gonna be 12, right? So that's all I wanted to point out. But John, sorry, I'll John. clarify, as long as the issue is staying in the budget, I'll go with either. Okay, so you're, so let's, I think that we can make everybody happy here if we put eight in there um we leave eight in there we work forward uh if, if staff comes to us and says we can't get the job done for that we can certainly look at there'll be there'll be some dollars here and there that we can free up someplace that we would have to move there we could do that if if they get done for less that's great but it sounds like we have a lot of people that have have passion for this and they will go out and they will do the right thing and, and get us heading the right way but i agree I, 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 I feel that there, there's enough people there that are going to make sure the right thing happens. And, and I, I really believe it as, as a district, we are already well along the way. I, I can certainly think of other organizations that are much further behind on, on this issue than we are. And, and that, that goes to staff and, and management in, in, in recognizing that this is, this is diversity is very important in, in our role in, the, in this county. So um, I think that's great. Thank you. We're gonna find this, we're gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna see that what needs to get done gets done. Thank you, John. So, yeah, I appreciate the conversation. So we will, the tentative that you'll see obviously approving has the 12 in it, but at the final version, and we'll make a notation that that's been moved to eight. So we'll take that down by four. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. 
The next one is our dump truck replacement at 55,000. And we did provide some supplemental information that uh, our operations team and mechanics on sites and fleet put together for you to, to review. So. And I see Perry and John are both here and I have one question and I asked you this the other night uh, do, or the other, yesterday, I guess it was. Do either of you know about what this, the used truck will bring what you think it'll bring when we when we sell it at this time? Because this fifty five thousand is not the net. This is just what we would purchase one for. So what 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 do we think the this one? I'm, I'm trying to get to what the net is on this. So John, are you all right with me uh, answering John's question? Oh yeah, yeah. Whoever. Yeah, whoever, yeah, uh, yeah whoever Go ahead. Perry yeah. Perry researched this today, so he's got he's got some information. Um, evening, John. Um, yes, uh, we contacted uh, Jim Obanoff, Obanoff Auction. They do a lot of uh, auctioning of municipal equipment. So we asked John, or excuse me, Jim Obanoff, uh, if there was something comparable to what they have recently auctioned off, and they came up with uh, two pieces of equipment. Uh, Geneva Park District uh, just recently, within it looks like about the past year, auctioned off uh, the exact same vehicle, 2001. Ford F-350 uh, power stroke diesel, 6.7 liter. Um, and it's six speed, only with 19,000 miles. And uh, they were able to get 30,000. Did you say 13, Perry? It said 32,750. Oh. Now, in comparison, uh, there was another municipal vehicle that was sold uh, last October um, it does not specify the municipality, but it's a 2008 F-350 6.4 liter diesel that had 38,572 miles. That was a plow truck similar to our setup uh, without selling the spreader, but going with selling the plow, the Western plow, uh, you know, in the dump box, of course. Um, again, 38,572 miles, that came at $16,500. So again, I think the mileage, you know, doesn't seem like a lot, but these are old vehicles, 10, 11, 12 years old. And even though that difference of 18,000, 19,000 miles compared to the 38,000 miles makes a big difference in the cost. So we asked Jim, what, what, what are we looking at for, you know, uh, V95, our 2011 one ton diesel. Uh, again, that has the plow set up on it. And uh, he said probably around $25,000, you know, so Again, you're net about thirty thousand. Okay, so we're netting about thirty thousand dollars. You get ten years out of them, um, so you're talking about three thousand dollars a year in depreciation is about what you're talking right now. Yeah, I do want to clarify too, John, that um, when I spoke at last month's board meeting, you know, a lot of us were keen on that vehicle being a plow vehicle dedicated, you know, much to snow removal as well as salting for de-icing our parks. Um, that vehicle is also a shared vehicle. Uh, that vehicle gets shared with facilities maintenance crew, uh, you know, so it is utilized throughout the year, uh -huh. 12 months. Um, you know, whether it's for facilities maintenance, us LPNR once in a while needs to borrow it. Uh, we also use it sometimes to do a cooperative project with a contractor if we can haul the material either demo or hauling uh, building material in to, uh, you know, reduce some of the costs of that project. So that those vehicles, all four of them, of the one tons that we do own are used throughout the year. And Perry, you did say, I did read that it's critical to our in-house resurfacing of um, hot mix asphalt, right? So Dave, that, that's a good example of, of a cooperative project with a contractor. It's not the uh, HMA asphalt resurfacing of our trails, but it's the, the limestone screenings, uh, you know, that we're working through on phases on the Hebron Trail. We started on the Prairie Trail North, working on our way towards Hebron. We hit, you know, the North Branch a couple of years ago, we're keen on Hebron Trail, so both trucks get utilized to haul that limestone screening material to the paver, and then we have the contractor lay that down a two-inch cap overlay over the existing roller packet. So that's a good example of that. We own. Do we, did I hear we own four of these? Is that right? That is correct. One four. Each one is housed in one quarter of the county. So. Region three gets shared with facilities maintenance and the rangers. Region two has one, region one has one. 
and then regions four, five, and six in the southeast corner of the county, they share just one, one ton dump. And if you recall, that, that's why we put in for uh, a rolling dump trailer uh, in the budget for regions four, five, and six. So they have something to haul material with as well, since sometimes it's difficult for three regions to share one dump truck. Okay. I, I was just trying to, uh, you know, ascertain as to what what, what the use was on all of them and, and uh, if there was any way we could downsize a vehicle and, and I didn't know how often all of them were being used on the same day or not, if there was any opportunity that we could downsize a truck or, or, or whatever. Uh, and you have to know how often they're all being used at the same time because I, moving them across the county is, is not a terrible ordeal. I moved tractors across a couple of counties. So um, I know it takes some time, but on the other hand, uh, I can't afford to own a tractor for every, every place I go. Um, well, so. Barry, can you shed some light on that question? Uh, in general, I know some of this is seasonal, is it the is it the exception or the rule that all of the trucks are being used at the same time or is there any information you can give us on that yes i can so of course in winter time having snowfall event with only having four one ton dumps and those are the vehicles that they serve two purposes of course snow removal but then they follow up and they'll chase you know uh, putting down salt and sand depending on what the conditions are. So at that time, all four being utilized at the same time. Makes sure. sense. Spring, summer, and fall, probably more so in the summer, early fall, late spring when conditions are ideal. That's when the ranger staff, when we do have seasonals, are out getting our projects done. So there's a peak there probably May, June, July, August, September, into October that they're being utilized quite often. And again, you don't see the mileage because we have one in each corner of the county, but they're out on site being utilized, you know, for projects, you know, whether it's a trail project demo, you know, uh, again, cooperative projects. Uh, so depends on the time of year, but I'd say, you know, 70, 75% of the time they're being utilized, you know, uh, simultaneously. Sure. A truck sits there quite some time while somebody loads it with brush or whatever. It probably sure. sits for, for quite some time. It doesn't get any miles doing that, but it does. It does. It is being utilized in the fact that it's just sitting there, but it, it needs to sit there till it gets loaded. Yeah, that's a great point, John. And and that's what if you see the you know the information that Jim Obanoff sent us on the last two that were auctioned off, or you know comparatively speaking, again you're looking at you know, and I don't know the reasons why, but again, right. look similar power stroke diesels, nineteen thousand miles another one at 39. So for us, push it at the 45, relatively speaking, I think we're doing pretty good. Was there um, just a question? I'm sorry, just one quick question. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, and I know, and this isn't going to change anything for me, but um, you, I thought there was something mentioned about the fact that it's a diesel. Is If we move away from the diesel, is there a chance that we end up um, it lasting a little bit longer? Was there a reason, like our diesels, it, it should, fewer miles on a diesel, harder on that type of, of, of truck? Um, or am I misunderstanding something that was said earlier? No, I'm sure John and Pat and uh, others, you know, that are familiar with uh, diesel vehicles, they're meant to run long periods of time and uh, to put a lot of miles on them and, you know, their payload and towing capacities. Um, as I had mentioned last month, I am not sure why, and I'm not shrugging off responsibilities. I'm not sure why 11 years ago, 12 years ago, that we, you know, we went with the purchasing of the diesels. Um, I can tell you this, that we have a 2011 V95 that we're looking to replace. That's a 6.7 liter power stroke. They, they changed the exhaust recovery uh, systems on those back then. So we have actually an older one, a 2009 with a 6.4 power stroke, uh, 6.4 liter that we're having a few issues with because of emissions control uh, so there's a recovery on unspent fuel through the emissions of, of this diesel system on this one ton dump truck. That's what's giving us the issues. I spoke to our head mechanic, system mechanic as well. Typically with those diesels, uh, you, you can't recover that just by idling. They, they need to be on the road running. I think that's why we're, we're having issues with these. We just, we're not putting on, you know, the runtime 
uh, or, or the mileage, as John had mentioned earlier, you know, they'll, they'll sit in one spot while they're getting loaded or unloading, you know, during a project. So that's why the mechanics re recommend that moving forward, we go with either V8 or V10, you know, with a, with a gear down rear end to still have that, you know, um, torque and, and pulling power that we need uh, because we're pulling dual axle trailers with uh, whether it's 22, 25 horse, you know, John Deere tractors up to two swinger 2000s and a little larger equipment. Uh, and again, it's safer. We, we can do it with a, with a three quarter ton pickup. But again, um, when you get that weight moving, sometimes it's easier, it is easier to handle it with a bigger truck, you know, such as the one ton. Um, that's why we, but anyway, that's why we want to get away from the diesels. It's just, we're, we're are, not are, all, are, the four that we own, are the four that we own now, are they all diesels, all four of them? I'm sorry, John, are they what? Are they all diesels, the ones we own now, all four of them are diesels? All four are diesels. So I asked Kyle, the assistant mechanic this morning when we were doing the research, I said, so what are we looking at for the next one that uh, is up for replacement? You know, the timetable on that. The schedule and it would be a uh, region one which is an older 2008 6.4 liter um even though it it's an older truck with higher mileage it's not giving us the issues with that recovery system that the 2011 has so we're looking at one now can be deferred um but then we're starting to stack a couple up back to back um possibly okay pat did i hear you wanting to chime yeah in? i got i got a suggestion um I got a couple of things. First of all, you got plenty of pickup trucks. Maybe it's cheaper. You need something to haul stuff with. Maybe you should get a, another one of those dump trailers. And since, you know, that's a lot cheaper than, uh, and there's basically, there's hardly any maintenance on one of those, those dump trailers you pull behind a pickup. And then obviously, of course, when you buy a diesel, that's like a seven or eight thousand dollar, you know, additional cost. Which that's why you're not going to do that anymore. But sure. I mean, a, a, a three quarter ton truck, or even a ton truck, um, would pull a dump trailer. Those oh. those. How is the dump trailer working that you've gotten so far, Perry? Is that working pretty well? We have not. It was budget for this upcoming year. Okay, so that hasn't been taken care of. You haven't worked with it yet, then. I'm sorry. Yes, I guess no, my timing was off. No, not at all. And that, that, that Pat brings up a great point. That's why, you know, we researched that last year in the Rangers, and that's why that's going down to 456, you know, to uh, to utilize a dump trailer like that. And uh, that may be the route to go. Uh, we'd have to do further research, um, you know, on that, the, see if that's feasible to replace one tons, you know, down the road. I, th okay. I think I'm comfortable with the information on the uh, uh, the trade-in allowance and with the information that we're sort of transitioning from diesel to uh, gasoline over the lifetime of the remaining uh, trucks and um, uh, with the information about the percentage of time, roughly winter and and uh, uh, three or four other months of the year that all the trucks are being used at the same time, it would seem uh, to me that um, this $55,000 figure is, uh, is quite acceptable. So, Me too. Thank you, Bill. I agree. Um, okay. Can I add one more thing, John? Sure. Go ahead, Harry. Please do. Just, you know, just for us moving forward too as well, you know, uh, whatever we purchase, whenever we purchase it, um, you know, we had staff also research um, ways to get these undercarriages cleaned after salting. I mean, the salt just eats them up. That, that's what's sure. you know, really doing the damage to the undercarriage and these estimated costs, you know, coming up for replacing brake lines, power steering, whatever it may be. We purchased a couple undercarriage pressure washers. They sit on wheels and they, you slide them up underneath the staff can to, to you know, get that salt off. We have three. We have three shops that can accommodate that purpose. You know that 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 cleaning of the vehicles. You know, so that's the direction we're going moving forward, to hopefully extend the life of these vehicles. Uh, you know, to get our money's worth, as well as there's a product out there called Fluid Film. Um, it gets applied um, at the beginning, like of a plow season during prep in the fall, and it only needs to be uh, applied once during the snow removal season. It's a, it's a it's a heavier film made for that purpose 
we're researching that as well in, in hopes of that we could use that, apply that to our trucks at the beginning of the plow season, you know, and, and then do so again next the next year. Uh, I also contacted MCDOT, uh, one of our former employees for the conservation district works for MCDOT. He's on the plow crew. Uh, we reached out to him as well and asked him, you know, what does MCDOT do with their trucks? You know, and they're running six ton dumps and bigger. They have, they have big equipment. They're basically doing the same thing we've been doing. You know, they're, they're, they're rinsing off, spraying down the undercarriages to try to get as much salt off as possible at the end of the plow season. Then they put them up on the rack and give it a deep cleaning. Uh, we, we just, you know, don't have those capabilities, but there are things we can do to hopefully extend the life of these vehicles. When did you start the, un the undercarriage washing and everything? Like, is that just recently or has that been a few years or when did you start that? last 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 winter season we got one winter season through that so so these trucks that are several years old have had several years where where they the salt laid in there and yeah. okay um, glad to hear you're being proactive that way we did also uh ask you know mcdot uh the, some of their plow vehicles they've done they've gone with the undercarriage you know treatment the spray uh, -huh. uh they said that it doesn't last very long uh, we do have about four or five vehicles in our fleet. Uh, some of our half ton, three quarter ton pickup trucks that that came with that undercoating, and you put them up on the rack after a few years, it's pretty much non-existent. So we're hoping that that fluid film that we apply each fall, you know, will, will serve as that protectant. Very good. Okay, um, and I believe that is still in the budget. Is that correct, Elizabeth? Correct. Yes. Is there anyone that has an issue with that at this point in time? No, I think okay. I think it should stay in the budget. Okay. All right. I, I'm not hearing any anybody really asking for that to be pulled. Um, so I thank you, Perry and John, for your research on that, and and uh, hopefully we can be flexible and 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 keep continue to look for ways to extend the use of these trucks or 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 use other vehicles or whatever um, to save money. But thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. So the, the last item, and I'm just going to be timekeeper. So we've got a quarter till uh, to six, and we do want to have a conversation presentation by Andy on the abatement. Um, the one other item we had was the generator. Um, we moved that from 90,000 to 50,000. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Uh, we don't have, John, is uh, any additional information on that yet on solutions? No, we don't. Uh, and we, we have not researched it extensively. Uh, we've got to figure out how the building functions to see if there are critical areas that, uh, that you know, just those areas that we can power. So we're going to have to do a little bit of research on that. Uh, and, you know, it may very well be that $50,000 will do it once we get some research done on it. Uh, but that'll be something that will be uh, that, that Chris uh, Zienko will be doing uh, in the next um, probably month or so. Perfect. Sounds good. So that 50,000 is in there. Anybody have a reason to have that pulled out at this point in time? Well, I would, I would pull it because we don't have sort of, I mean, it's a placeholder, but John, you know, they, they have a lot of things to do we're understanding that they're going to get back to us when they have uh, have done their uh, homework, so to speak, and and looked at uh, uh, portable or whatever the other options are. Um, uh, this uh, is a long-term need, but it's not something that uh, you know you can go for years not needing it. So I I think I personally, and now it's just you know my point of view. It's something that is in the pipeline, but I'm not sure belongs in the budget because we don't have, we haven't completed our homework. That's just where I am. Okay, so I have one person that would pull it. Oh, I, Pat, did I, did I hear you? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, I agree with Bill. I don't think we should just put it in the budget just to put it in there, not knowing anything about what it, what it you know, have the fact, we don't have the facts. So I would, I would pull it. I'm in favor of pulling it. Well, I do that respect is. that, but my worry is, is that if we did have a power outage, you heard the whole thing about Lost Valley Visitor Center and the geothermal, 
And uh, if we can get uh, something out there this year so I don't have to worry about it next year, um, I think that's proactive. I don't want to risk waiting and waiting and then all of a sudden the power goes out and then we've got this enormous amount of money in repairs. So that's where I'm at. That's why I want to leave it in. Okay, Dave would like to leave it in. Um, so uh, can I just say, so I thought it was my understanding that it wouldn't be purchased for this year. It would be this winter because it's not in the budget. Am I wrong? No, well, that would be winter, next winter. It you'd would be, be next winter. You'd be correct, but it would be, so it'd be for next winter, but it would be in the budget we're discussing now. Okay. You know, this budget takes effect in April. Right. So we're done this winter. Right. So this winter, nothing would happen. Right. What we're discussing is if, if, if we put the $50,000 in there, if they found yeah. they could get it done for $50,000 in say September, it would be in time for next winter. If we don't right. take it in this budget, nothing will happen for next winter. For next winter. Okay. So for next winter. So that's, that's where we're at. So, so this winter, I mean, we're in the middle of January, obviously nothing's going to happen. We're not going to get a generator put in we didn't have it in the budget it's not sure, going to happen sure, now sure so um all we're all we're discussing and and where i'm at is if we take this to the county board and the, and we have some people on the county board that take it item for item and they ask us okay what's the what's this money for the generator i didn't feel comfortable with ninety thousand dollars because i don't think it should cost ninety thousand dollars i could be wrong and I didn't know that we could give an explanation. I think $50,000 we can probably explain. Um, I, and maybe the question will never come up. I just know that when we, when we sit in front of the county board, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna sit there and say, we haven't researched this enough. And then they start to question, well, what else did you not research along the way? And so I'm fine with either way with this, but if it's left in there, I, I would like at least and I think we found a little bit, but we could at least say we've got a generator that we've found that's going to be twenty, thirty thousand dollars and we think it's going to be fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to install it. There's where you get your fifty thousand dollars. And we could explain that. I, I just I just don't want to go before the public and say, yeah, we threw ninety thousand dollars in the in the budget and we have no idea what we're talking about. I hear you, John. Yeah, you know. and I think yeah, that made a lot of sense, and that's why we brought it down from the 90,000. I do think that um, in this particular issue, I thought was raised as a concern, as a risk management issue, like what Dave was talking about when we first started, um, that we run the potential for some serious damage out there if, um, if we don't have something backing up that geothermal system. I think uh, if the, the way that it was presented before was that Brookdale was $45,000. Lost Valley is much larger, almost twice the size. And that's where they came up with the 90,000. But the reality is maybe we don't need to back up. We're not necessarily having to back up the entire system, like the entire building. You just wanna make sure you protect certain parts of that building. So I, I, I understand, um, so I'm, I'm fine with the 50,000. I think not putting it in the budget, there's a couple of problems with that. We're already not able to do this year because this winter, because it's not in our current budget. If we don't put it in the 22 budget, we're not gonna really be talking about solving this problem until the following winter. So you're talking about winter of 22, 23. Um, so if we think that we are at risk or this is a potential liability and it could be fairly significant, then, um, and we know that we covered a backup system at Brookdale, $45,000. Um, we're not looking to do the whole building. 50,000, like you said, John, could be very reasonable. I do think it's explainable. Um, and it puts us in a position to be able to protect that building when we finally come up with exactly how, what that would look like. And I appreciate the fact that that was raised as a potential issue. So I think on, from the one perspective is do we as a group think that this is a, a liability and how are we willing to take that risk? Um, I think 50,000 is, is, could be defense uh, could be defended in, in in some of the numbers that have been brought forward certainly better so than the 90 like we were talking about um, and if to the extent that we get to next year and, we, and it doesn't um, and for some reason we don't do anything although I think that would be unlikely um, it goes back into reserves it's not like we're taking it from the levy 
Well, and, and it's not like we're not protected at all because we do have insurance and not that we want to collect insurance and not that we want to have damage out there or anything like that, but we're, it's not like we're not protecting it, protected that building in one shape or another. Um, obviously. No, uh, but our rates, yeah, right, but our, our rates could go up because sure. we've already had issues in the past. And if we were, right. if we recognize this is a potential risk and we choose not to do anything, and well, they come back in and look at our response to this. That could, I think, uh, I, I, I don't cause. I agree. I, I, they haven't asked us to do anything, and, and, and it's not like they've come to us and said you need to do this, or we're not going to insure the building any longer. So we, we haven't we haven't we haven't reached that point, but we don't want to reach that point either. So um, so I, I guess I'm fine with the fifty if for right now, and gives us some chance to do some research and hopefully get something done but so Dave and Lynn and I are somewhat there Linda I, I can't remember where were you on this I'm gonna go <laughs> I'm sorry I'm oh boy since I could go either way I'm in the middle so I'm okay I'm You're okay I with mean, 50 in there yeah is Chris joined us yet yeah it's <laughs> John I'm here okay and so yes I I agree. I think we need to, to go ahead and budget it because I think we, we need to do something over the summer uh, with a portable system to uh, to do the job. So I, I agree with 50. You think 50? And you think there's a good, a reasonable, that that is a reasonable number? Chris? Yes, because I've done a little research and we can uh, buy some used uh, generators that are size probably way bigger than what we need uh, for uh, a lot less. I, in fact, uh, I just have one in, in stock, actually, a real big one from a wastewater treatment plant, and uh, we could we could purchase that for probably around ten thousand dollars or less. So, but your hookup equipment and your switching is expensive. Sure. So I, you want I realize that, it's, that the generator isn't all the expense. But... All right, right. But I still think we can get it done. Here way under the thing. Well, maybe not way, because we're going to put switches at each facility, and I think be able to have this generator portable to move to wherever it's needed. Okay. So. All right, so I've got, I've got kind of a split board here, but I think the majority is saying that we could put the 50 in there and then and try to work around that before next winter. Is that is that the consensus I'm hearing from everybody? Yep. Are we, everybody all right with that? Yep. Okay. All right, so that's good because it's already, we moved it to 50, so it's in the tentative as that. And then the last thing was an other. Um, was there anything else that hasn't been brought forward? Uh, speak now. <laughs> All right, I think, we're, I think we're good there. If anybody comes up with anything along the way, please speak up and, and we can go from there. Um, Andy has a presentation for us. This is important uh, for us is how, how we're going to proceed as far as abatements and uh, or an abatement. And it, it, it could have some um, some longer term effect one way or the other. So uh, this is very important for the board as to what our what our our plan going forward is. So anyway, Andy, I, I turn it over to you and and uh, Bill and I watched some of this, or watched it yesterday, and Andy's done a good job as he always does, uh, in putting this together. Uh, can everybody see that first slide, the 2020 levy? Yep. Abate? All right. You can hear me, okay? Yep. All right. Yep. Um, we did send out some slides ahead of time. I'll tell you, I was hoping to reduce this down. I ended up adding a couple, of course, but I did try and shorten. <laughs> it. So let me try and move through this quickly because I know we're pressed for time. What we're looking to do is a consideration of an alternative abatement strategy. And I'm gonna fix something on my screen here real quick. And, and, and I guess backing up Andy, the board at, earlier on in the year agreed that we would, at least at that point in time, we had agreed to raise the levy and then turn around and abate it. And um, this is furthering this discussion. If anybody has a different opinion anywhere along the line, they, they should be feel free to, to speak up. So with, with this strategy, we would retain the full PTEL operational levy capacity, um, but we wouldn't increase the net total tax levy. So two good things. Um, and just to backtrack a little bit, um, what John just alluded to, 
Um, I'm going to show the calculation of the 2020 levy that you approved. So we start with the 2019 um, aggregate levy, and that's the general fund, the Social Security Insurance Fund added together. Those are the three levies of the district subject to PTEL. Um, collectively, they make up the aggregate levy. We were allowed to grow that by 2.3% for the inflationary increase. And that um, gave a total inflationary increase in the ag aggregate levy of $181,000. So that's the amount that we did decide uh, um, with a, the consensus of the board was we would abate that. And so the 22 tentative budget that's in front of you um, has abated that out. It doesn't include that in the property tax revenue. There's also a small amount of new development, uh, $40,000 of additional tax levy. Um, and the 22 budget right now includes that amount. Collectively, that's a total PTEL increase of 221,000 or 2.8% of the prior year. And as I go forward in this presentation, I'm not gonna try and break down new development versus the inflationary increase. I'm just gonna talk about the full PTEL increase because that's really what the strategy is gonna be based on. So we'll just be looking at that 221,000 going forward. And then just one last thought, as we know, we make up less than 2% or about 2% of the average tax bill. Um, that increase poses only a, you know, potentially a $1.37 uh, per homeowner of an increase in property taxes. One thing to remember is that through an abatement, that levy capacity that we give up is lost forever. So as we look at this, um, you know, the PTEL levy with a full increase for 20 on the top line, you see the 19 levy at 7,875,000 growing by the 221 to 8,096,000. And then if we abate that, like we're proposing originally, it's a neutral levy basically. So we're abating the whole thing, difference of the 221. As you go to the second year, the levy year 220, calendar year 221, which we'll be doing this fall, you'll see under the first one, when we capture that full levy increase, we start with the 8,096,000 and we get to grow it, I'm assuming two and a half percent. Um, and so that would be a $202,000 increase. And under the second option where we had a neutral levy for 20, that's only gonna grow by 196. Um, and so year over year in the, in the second year, you're gonna be um, under another $226,000 of lost levy capacity. So in just in those two years from that one abatement, you know, you're taking a full levy increase after that, you're giving up 448,000 and obviously that goes on in perpetuity. If you take that times 10, it's going to be over $2 million over 10 years. So through that abatement of the PTEL levy, it's a permanent loss of levy capacity. Um, a full levy in future years doesn't correct the revenue imbalance created from that levy abatement. And we've looked at that in the past, but I want to reinforce it again. So in this hypothetical scenario, I'm assuming there's a balanced budget where the revenues equal the expenses until we abate that PTEL increase of 221,000. So now that created a deficit for this 22 budget, which is kind of very similar to where we are today, although we're looking at a bigger deficit spend. If we assume that the revenues and expenses all grow equally by two and a half percent, and then we assume in the next year, we take a full levy increase. So this calendar 21 for the 23 fiscal year, we get a full levy increase. The deficit doesn't go away that was created with this 22. It still exists. And again, um, if you didn't reduce expenses and you paid for that just from reserves, you'd have a $448,000 reserve draw just in those two years. If you take that out a few more years and look at it again, it, it's never going to go away until you reduce an equivalent amount of operating expenses. And I can say, or until you find additional alternative revenue, but we know from the district's history with, you know, 82% of our revenue being property taxes, there's just not a, a lot of, you know, potential to, to draw the additional revenue. Um, and again, if we didn't offset those expenses over the course of those additional four years, you'd be looking at a 1.1 million draw in reserves. Obviously not something we're not showing this as a plan, it's just hypothetical to show you the impact of that, the permanency of that levy abatement. We know it firsthand too, because again, we've seen this chart, but I'll put it up one more time. It shows the general fund property tax levies from 2011 through 2019. The districts effectively really only increased the levy twice. And those are the green bars you see. So you see the two dark ones for uh, calendar year 15 and 16. Um, those were the two years we were able to increase the, the general fund levy against a reduced debt service levy. So because of the 14 refinance and we save $14 million, we we're actually able to increase the general fund levy and show a total tax levy decrease in levy years 15 and 16. 
Then the light bar in 18, we took a full levy again. And, um, and then after we went through the difficulty of getting that budget approved, that would be collected in 1920, the fiscal year 20 budget, we had to agree that we would reduce the 19 levy by the amount of that 18 increase with a small exception of like $37,000 for new development. Effectively, it was reduced. So really, I look at that and there's only been two times since 2011 where the district's been able to take anything close to the full PTEL levy increase. Um, and a schedule that we update every year. Um, this first part of it shows what the, di the district actually captured from the PTEL levies. So from 2000, it shows 11 through 20, that totals only from 12 through 20, 69.6 million, averaging only about a half a percent a year growth in levy. Comparatively, had we taken what was allowed under PTEL in each of those years, we would have collected an additional $6.4 million, almost $6.5 million in total. But even more important than that is that our um, tax levy capacity for that PTEL levy would be 1.3 million more with this 2020 levy than it is. So instead of being stuck with a 7.9, see if I can get my highlighter to work, you know, to this number 7.9 in one year, we'd be able to levy, levy 9.2 million, an additional 1.3 million of revenue. And that would basically solve all the issues we have on paper right now. We could put more on paper, probably, but um... yeah. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is an alternative levy abatement strategy, where we'd be able to retain the full two hundred twenty-one thousand of PTEL levy capacity and not increase that net total tax levy. And the way we do it is looking at the debt service levy. So in addition to the three levies that make up the total PTEL aggregate levy, the district also has a debt service levy that pays the contractual payments on the referendum approved general obligation bonds. And year over year, that's gonna grow $296,250. Um, that that levy is actually issued by the county clerk. When the bonds are issued, there's an ordinance that's filed with the county clerk. It provides for the service, the debt service levy on those bonds until they're paid in full each year. So the district doesn't actually originate that levy. If we do nothing, so if we had truly a neutral levy, we didn't even keep the new development, um, our total taxes would go up for 20 by $296,000. Now, historically, there's been no real concern or pressure on the district or, or really most taxing agencies about trying to mitigate a tax levy for voter approved bonds. And in fact, when we've gone through, you know, in the last three years where there's been a lot of political pressure, a lot of concern internally too from our own board, obviously, we've never considered and we're never expected to do anything to reduce that. So I'm assuming you know, all the trustees tonight are you know, very okay with this. In fact, the 22 budget total uh, tax growth is higher than this because we're including $40,000 new development. So this would actually be less tax dollars in total than what's in front of you with the 22 budget. The way that would work is, so right now I'm showing a neutral levy PTEL here, zero change. That would grow, we capture the full PTEL. And I should say that is the ordinance that you passed. So that's already been filed with the county. The 221 has been filed um, and it's gonna get extended unless we abate it. So what we're proposing is we're not gonna abate it, we're gonna let it sit. And what we would do instead of letting this debt service grow by 296, and that again, that levy will be issued. What we would do is we would abate 221,257. So we would abate the same amount. So the debt service levy would go down to 12.3 million effectively, only growing by $74,000. And then the total levy year over year would only grow by that same 296,000 bucks. So I just bring that forward. This is the same chart we just looked at. Um, it's a full PTEL increase. We abate 221 of the debt service, and then the total tax levy is 296. Versus the way we were headed was a neutral PTEL. We're going to abate the full PTEL increase, so there'd be no change year over year, no growth. But the debt service would go as is, and so you're, you know, they come out the same. It's a 296,000, 250 dollars increase under both scenarios. So retaining 221 of operational revenue without increasing the net total tax levy 
seems like a no brainer, right? I mean, what's, what's the give? Why wouldn't we do that? So there's a, there are a couple issues we have to think about. One is the debt service levy of 12,570 represents the total contractual payments on the bonds. So if we don't collect 221,000 of that debt service, we still have to pay the full amount. And so how would that get paid? It would have to get paid from some other operating revenue source and or reserves or some combination of the two. And the second thing to think about is, is this a one-year occurrence? Meaning if we abate that debt service levy today, um, we grow the PTEL, it's neutral, there's no impact you know, to the, on the 20 levy, um, does everything go normal in 21? Do we have to be concerned about the levy this fall? And so I wanted to look at that. So again, this shows the debt service levy grow by 296, a neutral levy, this is kind of the scenario one. So it's a full debt service levy, the PTEL's abated, as we go into year two now, we're assuming the contractual obligations on the bond will go by, grow by $300,000. And then we assume we take a full PTEL levy this calendar year 21 of 196,000 or 2.5%. Again, that's hypothetical. So that's the first scenario. And now in the second one, we're talking about the debt service abatement and taking the full PTEL. So we know in this year, they're the same, right? And so if we abate this 221 of debt service, our total taxes are unchanged. That seems like an easy, should be a fairly easy story to tell. As you go into the second year now, the debt service is gonna to jump to 12.8 million. It doesn't start with this reduced number. The county clerk will automatically issue the amount for the full payments of the bonds you know, due for the county of 21. So when you look at the total taxes now in that second year, by taking this additional PTEL levy here, there's actually gonna be you know, a, a rippling effect as Trustee Cook called it yesterday, um, where we would continue to see a kind of a, a, a small, that same $200,000 increase in tax year over year. And so that difference is 226. So uh, again, this is taking the um, abated PTEL levy, so a neutral PTEL and letting the debt service grow without abating it, that's one versus two. If you look at these total taxes now where we don't abate debt service um, and we abate the PTEL, this is the total tax dollars year by year. And in order to mitigate this one abatement, you'd have to abate it really every single year to get you know, out here to 27, 23 million 53,000 and 23 million 53,000. Now I'm not suggesting that this has to happen um, but we should be prepared, be prepared to consider that we, you know, if things stay tight, um, there's a lot of issues with COVID and what's happening politically, that it may be multiple years we have to look at possibly abating this to kind of stay neutral. The other reality too is at any time uh, you could, you know, you could make that up rather than paying from reserves by reducing expenses or something to that effect. And, and Go ahead. And Andy, Andy we, we could at some point in time, if we felt that we needed to, we could and we felt that we, we could work with the county board and the county chairman, possibly not abate anything and, and take the full increase at that year. Correct, right, That's you'd have to take that year by year just like we do now as we look at the levy and where things stand. Um, the accumulated reserve impact then, if we you know, had to do it every single year going forward, again, just kind of looking at worst case, you'd be looking at a 1.4 million draw. The thing to remember is when we get out to levy year 26, this debt service levy, the debt's paid in full. We don't have any more debt. So it goes from 14.1 million to zero. It's a 60% reduction in the total property taxes. Total tax bill of the district will go from 23 million to $9.3 million. So there's no longer anything to abate. Even if we were still abating it out here, there's nothing to abate and we're done with it. And then to kind of show the same two scenarios again quickly, just looking at it more from a full revenue expense, you know, versus just the levy on paper. In scenario one, we abate the 2020 PTEL levy increase as we were proposing. It's neutral. There's no debt service abatement. Um, it, it's in this scenario we're saying it creates a deficit equivalent to that uh, PTEL abatement of 221,257. In all the future years, revenue expenses will grow by 2.5%. Um, and we assume a full PTEL levy then in the future years. And then in the second scenario, again, it's the uh, abatement of the debt service levy, but a full uh, 2020 PTEL increase. And then we assume the budget's balanced because we're not giving up that 221 for the fiscal year 22. Everything else is the same. Um, we'd also assume kind of worst case scenario, 
where we had to continue to abate that debt service all the way through fiscal year 28. So looking at that first scenario with an abated PTEL increase, um, you can see we have a projected net operating deficit of 221,257. We grow revenue and expense by two and a half percent. We take a full levy increase and we drive that all the way out to 28. And basically, you know, you have that operating deficit there every year. Again, at any time, you could always, you know, not easily done, but you reduce expenses and make that go away and disappear. You could obviously reduce expenses under both of these scenarios. So interestingly too, in this scenario, if you didn't do anything to mitigate this deficit, if you didn't reduce expenses, as you get out to the final year, it doesn't go away, it's still there. You know, that those expenses are still outpacing revenues. Um, let's see here, in scenario two, where we take the full 20 PTEL levy, so now we have a balanced budget, there's no deficit in the 22 budget. And then we grow everything by the same amount. And so again, you're always looking at a balanced budget. Revenues expenses are growing equally. But now we have to add in, again, worst case scenario, a debt service abatement for every one of those single years. Then you're going to see an accumulated reserve spend or slash revenue reduction of $1.4 million as you get out to fiscal year 27. But interestingly, now when you go to 28, that doesn't change because again, the debt's paid in full. There's nothing to abate. It goes down to zero. Comparing those same two scenarios, just a quick summary of them. Um, I got the first year and then the year before the last and then this last year here. So again, you can see under scenario one where we where we abate the PTEL, you know, this deficit's still growing unless we do something on a set it. The draw and reserves is still growing unless we give up the resources, the you know, reduce expenses, services, whatever we would need to do. Under scenario two, the debt's paid in full. The debt service expense goes away. There's nothing to abate. So the maximum draw in reserve, so to speak, just due to this, would just be that $1.4 million. Just as importantly, or even more importantly, when you look at that last year, the operating PTEL levy capacity in scenario two, where we abate the debt service, is 9.3 million versus 9.1. So it's an additional $256,000 of levy capacity. And again, that's permanent. So you take that out 10 years, you're looking at you know two and a half million dollars of additional property tax resources for the district. Um, two more slides just showing quickly, could we afford to do worst case scenario from reserves if we needed to? Um, I'm estimating the ending reserve balances at fiscal year 22 of $5.2 million. And that would include this debt service abatement. And you take that all the way out you know, to 2027 um, the other thing I do add in is we have enough funding in the camp, about a million dollars, to take it through the budget year 22 and probably 23. After that, the average ex you know, expense we have on the camp fund is about a half a million dollars. So that would, as we know, would need to come from the general fund reserves. So we'd have to start drawing that down too, and you'd end up in, in this hypothetical scenario with $2.2 million. That's just below the 25% threshold. Um, a pretty manageable position if we needed to do it. But obviously, so many things are going to happen, you know, yet alone 21, 22, yet alone as we try and look out, you know, three, four, five years. Um, and then it, it was asked too, you know, could you possibly sustain this for multiple years? So um, we take a full PTEL levy in 20, we abate the debt service, then we take a full PTEL levy in 21, but we abate the debt service again to try and stay neutral. So the first year looks the same because we, you know, we're looking at abating that 20 debt service. In the second year, now you have to abate the 21, the, the 20 abatement, and now the 21 debt service or PTEL growth from debt service. So now you're looking at a $450,000 abatement every year. When you play that out, you know, you'd run the reserves down to 1.8 million. That's well below the 25% threshold. It's probably at about 15%. Um, things would get pretty tight there probably still have enough to have liquidity, you have probably no investments. So uh, really not very manageable. Doing one year is pretty manageable. Doing two would be pretty difficult to do. What we're looking for from tonight is basically a consensus from the trustees that we wouldn't abate any part of the 2020 tax levy subject to PTEL. So the levy the board issued in September would stand unchanged. And then we would abate 221,000 of the debt service levy which obviously is used for the contractual payments on the voter approved bonds. And that's it. Andy, you had me at, can you see the slide? So I'm good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Do 
we have a consensus then? So we, uh, so going forward, if we did this, we'd have, uh, we'd of course need to run this by the county board chairman and the county board is, is to see if there was some agreement there. Hopefully there'd be no pushback. This would definitely give us a little more, not a lot, but it would give us a little more uh, wiggle room going forward. And it would get us through this COVID year and uh, everybody's taxes could stay flat and we could, um, we could retain a, a, some possibility of, of some income going forward. Uh, but, you know, we have to be in agreement and then we need to, we need to go on and we need to have that discussion with, with, with the county board and that chairman. Um, so was there any discussion on this board? We want this board to be in agreement before we go forward anywhere else. I'm comfortable with uh, abating, taking the abatement from the tax debt service levy um, as proposed. I'll leave it at that. This would seem to be our last abatement. Um, and I think, you know, that gives us some, um, um, it gives us a narrative that we can present to the county board that look at, we have tried to hold the line on our property tax levy. We have this uh, scenario where we're taking advantage of the fact that our debt service is coming to an end within the foreseeable future. But in order to maintain the 25% sort of cushion in our reserves, we're not going to be able to do this more than once, so to speak. So we do it this year and we go, uh, you know, one year at a time until uh, the, uh, we get to the uh, uh, end of the, of the uh, until the GO bonds are paid off. So, yeah, Bill, I agree with you, but also look at that. We've already given up and been forced to give up almost $6.5 million. So, well, you know, Dave, I, I mean, I think that's been a bitter pill to swallow. Um, uh, and obviously, there are politics and economic circumstances that, that uh, led to the board and the staff going in that direction. In other words, if someone holds a gun to your head and says, well, you have to do this, then, you know, then you have to do it. Um, now, clearly, there's been a political change. I think that um, anyone who questioned um, our, our um, you know, I don't think anyone could point the finger at us and say, you have not used your reserves in a prudent fashion, or why are you hiding all these reserves? We've basically tried to hold the line, We're, even though real estate values seem to be going up in the pandemic, I think there are a lot of people who are going to be struggling to make ends meet. The part of the household owner's tax um, that goes to the district is, and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, it's more than that $1.37 because that didn't include the debt service levy. Right. The dollar thirty seven was just the increase. That's the equivalent of 221000 spread across the EAV of the district of the county. Oh, all right. So well, anyway, anyway. Just, you know, not to take everyone's time, I'm comfortable with this strategy and I would support it. And, and Dave, dear, I, I wasn't quite sure where you were going with your point. I, I understand that we took this, we've taken a hit for six and a half. Are you saying not to abate anything? Is that? Oh, no, that no, I'm total in agreement of the abatement of the oh, debt service, okay. but I just want to make sure people, I'd love the public and the county board to know that 6.5 million that we have sacrificed. That's all my book. I'm totally okay. in favor. We're going. I, I, I just want to make sure we're going in the same direction. Right. There. We are. We are. Okay. All right. All right. Good. 
All right, thank you. Uh, anyone else with a comment? Everybody on board, have a problem? Where, where, where does everybody feel about that? I'm okay. I'm okay. That's, Linda's good. All right, uh, Lynn? Yeah, I, I'm fine too. I think, you know, just kind of to Dave's point, I mean, I think we've, and what uh, Trustee Cook is saying, you know, we've done this for a long time. Um, we're, we're doing it again. And uh, we recognize the economic hardships that are out there. And um, I don't know, I think Elizabeth once said, taking it for the team and, and just, you know, showing that we're trying to do the right thing um, by everybody. Uh, I would hope that we will move forward into next year and just really, you know, insist that we be allowed to extend the levy. I mean, we can, ex I mean, we can extend the levy, but to actually build that into our budget so that um, we can um, move forward in a more financially stable way. I mean, we do have the responsibility to maintain the assets that we have and, and we can't run an operating or operate a business when you don't actually try to adjust for inflationary costs. It's just not a, it's not a good business model. And we can't keep it going forward and hopefully we will stick together and and insist next time around that this is we can't do this again we've said that a couple times already but I mean, we can't keep doing that we have to make the decision that this is this is it we you know it's a okay. do or die situation so okay thank, thank you chris do you have any comment yes no real comment just that i, I agree i think we can maybe debate this one time i don't be i agree with township board I understand what Andy was saying is this, uh, uh, once you start something, it, it's perpetual. So long story short, yes, I agree. I think we can go on with this. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and we are running a short on time. So I am gonna ask for public, at that point in time, I think we've got a consensus. We've got, a, we've got an idea where we're going. Um, I'm gonna ask for public comment and then I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn because the foundation well, it needs to get started at 6.30. So we have a, just a couple minutes. So is there any public comment out there? I, I don't see anybody. No, there, there's don't. One. Is there one? It's just, it's Kelly Wagner. I just want to uh, say thank you. Um, this, is a, this was a wonderful meeting. I, I'm glad it was the first one I attended. Um, and I am passionate about the environment and conservation. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys and work with you and um, in cooperation with the county board. So I'm excited to see where you guys are gonna go in this new political era. And uh, thank you for all the information I've been given so far. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, you have been, you've inundated me with information, which is good. <laughs> Elizabeth, glad to have you, Kelly, glad to have you. Glad to have you here, Kelly, welcome aboard. Uh, Thanks a lot for, I don't know if you volunteered or, or your arm was twisted or whichever. <laughs> however, I volunteered. Anyway, oh, good. Welcome, welcome here. And yeah, Elizabeth is really good at getting lots of information out to you. So uh, <laughs> that's that she like is. That. She's pretty good at that. <laughs> so with that being, good. John, I'm going to move to adjourn. Okay, well, thank I, you. Dan. I'm just going to, I'm going to welcome Kelly as well. I got on late, so I didn't get to say that. So okay. I'm real, real happy that you're I'll here. Second. So thank you. Okay. And I got a second from Pat. So we're good there. Uh, roll call vote, please. Um, Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Dom? Yes. Trustee Thomas? Yes. Trustee Brandt? Yes. Trustee Fritz? Yes. Trustee Campbell? Yes. And Trustee Henning? Yes, we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for your time and I'll see everyone Thursday night. <laughs>